Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for the webinar training this evening. Um, we'll be talking about this year's invasive species scavenger hunt, and uh, I'll be hosting the training tonight. My name is Amy Jewett, and I am the invasive species coordinator at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, and uh, I'm based in the Pittsburgh region. And I have with me tonight, Kirsten Carlson, who will be helping to answer questions um, during the training tonight. Kirsten, you wanna take a moment and introduce yourself as well? Hi, I'm Kirsten Carlson. I'm the information manager for the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And uh, I work mostly on the, the technical side of the IMAP Invasives database. And have a, have a great time tonight. This'll, this'll be a great, uh, a great training. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, Kirsten will be helping to answer questions that uh, you guys may have throughout the training. Feel free to use the Q&A to ask any questions that you have, and she will uh, do her best to answer questions as they come in. And then at the end, we'll also take time to answer um, any questions that come in at the very end as well. Um, this evening's um, uh, training will be recorded, and I will be sending out a link to that afterwards. I'll also be sending out a link to the story map or the presentation that I'll be showing tonight. So you guys will have that to reference. And uh, I'll also be sending out a spreadsheet of information on the different species that will be on this year's scavenger hunt checklist. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but um, we'll, I'll have a lot of follow-up information basically to send to all of you afterwards. So look from, for an email from me um, probably sometime tomorrow. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started and we'll talk about this year's invasive species scavenger hunt. So the purpose of this year's scavenger hunt um, is to highlight the issue of invasive species that are still being sold commercially in the trade. And unfortunately, there is um, a lot of species that are still being sold and can cause a lot of trouble if they are able to escape into our natural areas. And uh, a lot of the species that get planted um, purposely that are known to be invasive, do th they do just that, where they escape into um, forested areas, um, you know, water bodies and, and other places that are in our natural spaces that, that they, they then cause ecological harm. Uh, some of the species on the scavenger hunt list are also what I term early detection species. So these are ones that are not yet found in Pennsylvania, but are known from uh, nearby states or provinces. And there's also a few species on the checklist this year that are for insects. There's mostly plants, but there's also a few insects. And these are um, kind of higher priority in Pennsylvania right now. And at least one of them is an early detection species as well. It's not been found in Pennsylvania yet, but in other nearby states. So uh, we'll be talking more about the checklist here in a little bit. But I first also want to talk about um, all the things that you need to know as far as being a participant in this event. And this is the second year that we have held the scavenger hunt. Um, it was held for the first time last year and it was very popular. There was a lot of people that participated and I received a lot of really good feedback that people enjoyed it. And so here we are again, having this event again for the second time. So who is participating? Uh, each of you who have registered for tonight's training. Um, so as you are participating in this event, you'll need to have some kind of device that you're using to capture the information uh, for the presence or absence of the species that you're looking for. So that can be a smartphone, a tablet, or a desktop or a laptop computer. So whatever is most convenient for you or that you prefer to use. And you'll be searching for 15 specific invasive species um, that are on the checklist this year. So you'll be uh, reporting your findings of those species, uh, whether you detected them or not, presence or absence, and also taking photographs of their species, especially when you do find them, we wanna make sure we get good pictures of them. So this event takes place during the entire month of August, which will be here in just a few days, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so from August 1st to August 31st is your window of time to be searching for the species on the checklist. And you can uh, search in natural areas. There, that's the, the spaces and the areas that we're 
primarily interested in finding uh, where these species may be located at. So places like parks and forests and water bodies like ponds, lakes, and rivers. Um, if you are searching on private property, please make sure that you're first talking to the landowner and getting permission from that person to make sure that you're allowed to be serving on their property and also documenting information in a public database. So make sure that you're getting that permission if you are serving on private property. Also make sure that if you're serving on private property, you're only serving for the insect species. And the reason for not serving for the plants is a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, people will plant these uh, invasive species on purpose in their yards and gardens. Um, and the ultimate goal of IMAP is not to mark where these species are being found on private property because the goal is to be able to manage the species that we're documenting in IMAP. Um, and so we don't want to go manage someone's burning bush that's planted in their backyard. Um, so again, just be searching for the insect species if you are searching uh, on private property and look for the plants in those publicly accessible uh, spaces. And so the reason for the, um, the scavenger hunt and why, why we put this event on, again, is to help to raise awareness of some of the impacts that these species have on our, um, uh, our natural areas, as well as the native species and, and just the diverse habitats that we have here in Pennsylvania, as well as our economy. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with the, the fact that invasive species are very expensive to manage, and a lot of times the management is long-term, uh, adding to the expense that, that they can incur. So by documenting information as part of the scavenger hunt into IMAP invasives, we're helping to provide more uh, up-to-date information to people across Pennsylvania who do natural resource management and that sort of work to help them to know the spaces and, and different places across the state where management should be occurring at, um, because maybe they're not aware of a certain population of a species or you know, perhaps an, a finding of an early detection species, which would be really important to document. So also as part of this event, there are prizes that are involved and hopefully that helps to incentivize this event a little bit more. So this year uh, we'll be giving away a prize bundle of outdoor related gear to five individuals. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more at the very end of the training on how you can qualify to be a prize winner. So stay tuned for more information on that. Okay, so let's jump into the species list and talk a little bit more uh, about the species that you'll be searching for this year. Again, there's 15 species total uh, on this year's list. And um, some species have not been found in Pennsylvania before. And so, you know, if you do find one of these, that would be a very important finding that we would definitely want to know about. Most of these species uh, we do already have in Pennsylvania, but again, are ones that we want to be, um, you know, finding and reporting and uh, providing that information, uh, you know, in, in the form of, um, you know, documentation and IMAP and bases for use by natural resource professionals. So there's a total of eight terrestrial plants that are on the checklist. And they include burning bush, Norway maple, orange eye butterfly bush, Japanese spirea, bamboo, Chinese or Japanese wisteria, hardy kiwi vine, and garden valerian. And I do have some images of these um, uh, plants here. If you've not seen them before, you're not familiar with them. So here's the burning bush on the, starting on the left, Norway maple, uh, butterfly bush, and Japanese spirea, and then bamboo. Ja Japanese wisteria, hardy kiwi, want, hardy kiwi vine, and garden valerian. So those are the terrestrial plants. There's also a handful of wetland and aquatic plants that are on this year's checklist as well. Uh, they include going from left to right, looking at the images here, yellow iris, water lettuce, alligator weed, and water soldier. And just for your reference, the alligator weed and water soldier are two species that have not been found in Pennsylvania before. So those are the early detection species that I mentioned and are ones to be aware of because if we do find that they are coming into Pennsylvania, we wanna know about that as soon as possible so that we can prevent their further spread. And then finally, we do have three insects that you'll be looking for. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the infamous spotted lanternfly, so that is one of them. Asian longhorn beetle is another one and hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, so just looking at the images here, 
The first two on the left are different life stages of spotted lanternfly. So for those of you that might be from the eastern part of the state, specifically the southeastern part of the state, I'm sure you've seen this um, uh, insect already and are probably very familiar with it, unfortunately. Um, and so, well, this is one that we're looking for, especially in places where it is coming into Pennsylvania in, in new areas, in new counties. Um, and so again, it's, it's really good to make sure that we're surveying all across the state to see if we're finding new places where this insect is at. Um, the middle three images here are all of um, either the Asian longhorn beetle itself, which we can see here, or evidence that Asian longhorn beetle is in an area. And these two images here are egg sites. So this is where a female Asian longhorn beetle will chew um, uh, an egg site into uh, the trunk of a tree and she'll lay a single egg in there. And this is what that looks like. And so even if you don't see the actual beetle itself, if you see damage that looks like this on a host tree that the ALB will, um, will use for this purpose, that is sufficient enough to be convinced that there is Asian longhorn beetle in a particular area. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle will also make uh, exit holes when it exits the tree as an adult beetle, and it will also produce frass, uh, which is the excrement from the beetle. And so if you find any of those other things, which are not necessarily pictured here, um, but there's good information online about that. Again, those are um, things that would count as evidence for searching for and finding the Asian longhorn beetle. This is not one we have in Pennsylvania yet. I think I mentioned that already, but I just wanna make sure I mention that again. So if we do find even one finding of this beetle or one you know, site that has any kind of evidence, that is something that we wanna know about as soon as possible. Um, the, the USDA currently has quarantine areas set up for this species in Ohio, New York, South Carolina, and Massachusetts. And so far, thankfully, Pennsylvania is not on that list. But if we do find anything that resembles this, it's really important to make sure we're reporting it. And then finally, hemlock woolly adelgid. This is one that you're only going to find on hemlock trees and on the underside of the branches uh, of hemlock trees. And so it looks like these little uh, white egg sacs, or sometimes people will, will refer to it as like the tip of a cotton swab. So it's very small, um, but fairly distinct. And so uh, again, just on hemlock trees, will you be finding this particular uh, insect? So that's the list of 15 species. Those are the ones that you're going to be searching for. So in order to assist all of you in learning to identify these species, I'm sure there's some on this list that you are not familiar with already. So I have a spreadsheet that I put together um, that talks about, you know, and includes more information on how to identify these species. There's a lot of really good information online that I've kind of put all together into the spreadsheet that you can check out. And it also has information on the habitats where these species are being found. Um, you know, because some of these species won't be found in aquatic environments and vice versa. Uh, so it's important to know where you can, where, where you should be looking for these species at. So that will be information that, as I mentioned at the beginning of the training, I will be sure to send that out to all of you, probably sometime tomorrow morning, so that you can check that out at your leisure. Um, some of these species also may resemble other species, uh, either native or exotic, or maybe other invasive species as well. So it's important to make sure that you know how to distinguish these species from others. So there is uh, information in the spreadsheet that talks about lookalikes to be aware of as well. Okay, so this is something I threw in tonight's training. This is not something that you have to do in order to participate in the scavenger hunt. But I think it's something that might be worthwhile to do just because it will help to um, you know, expand your understanding of where these species are and that's to look up their distributions. And so prior to starting the scavenger hunt or maybe while you're doing it, so throughout the month of August, uh, I would encourage you to log into IMAP Invasives and look up some of the specific information that we have for these species as far as where they've been reported so far and confirmed at. Um, and this again will help to kind of better understand uh, how widespread they might be or perhaps how, how rare they might be in a particular area. Um, I always, whenever I'm looking up the distribution of a particular species, I always try to look at more than one because I know that different platforms, you know, they don't have all the information that's out there. Uh, and IMAP invasives is certainly one of those that, you know, we may not have all the information for a certain species. And so it's good to check other platforms that are out there as well. 
So some other places that you might look into are EdMaps. They're another um, uh, platform online that track invasive species. iNaturalist is one that tracks anything that's living, not just invasive species, so all sorts of different things. The Biota of North America program is, is a good one as well. And also the USGS non-indigenous aquatic species uh, platform is another one to check out. So again, I would encourage you to check out some of the distribution information for these species ahead of time if you're able to. And I did put together a short video, which is included here in the story map to, uh, this evening, that it's only about a three minute video, but it does give you the, the steps of how to use IMAP invasives to view the distribution information for a, a different or a specific species if you haven't done that already. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I will be sending out a link to this story map so you'll have access to view these videos and the different links that I have in here. Um, so anything that's blue and has an underline is, is a link that you can check out online. Okay, so we've talked about what the scavenger hunt is and we've talked a little bit about the species that you'll be searching for. I wanna talk next about um, how you'll be reporting your findings. So some of you may be um, familiar already with IMAP invasives and some of you may be new to it. So with IMAP, um, there's a few options that you have as far as how you can report information to the database. Uh, probably by far one of the most popular methods that a lot of people prefer to use is the IMAP Invasives mobile app. And this is available on a smartphone or a tablet. It's only used for data collection. So you can't actually use the app to view information or do queries or anything like that. It's just data collection. There is also, and this is on the newer side, uh, Survey123, which is made by Esri. Uh, they uh, have this app that the uh, makers of IMAP Invasives were able to use Survey123 and create uh, special data fields that you can use the Survey123 app and collect data for IMAP Invasives and then upload it directly into IMAP Invasives from that app. So it makes it a little bit easier um, there's a little bit more you can do with Survey123. You can create polygons and lines, and can, you can collect some additional information that the mobile app um, uh, does not allow. So it takes a little bit longer to create a data record, but it just gives you a little bit more options as well. And then finally, IMAP Invasives Online, which you can access on any device. As long as you have an internet connection, uh, you'll be able to use that. So whatever option you prefer to use to submit your information, you will need to have a login account um, no matter what. So make sure that you do have a login account already or you do sign up for one. And I'll talk just a, in a minute here about how to do that. But I do also just wanna mention because sometimes people will ask the question, what is the purpose of submitting absence information? Because that is part of the event. We're collecting both presence and absence information. And so absence information um, is showing that whenever you document that, it's showing that you, know, you have been there or someone else has been to a particular area, searched for a particular species and didn't find it. And that can actually be really valuable. Um, for me, especially with this event, it's giving me a visual um, look into where everyone is surveying at. So even if you don't find any presence information, I can get a general sense of where people are looking across the state, which is really helpful. But it's also really helpful for natural resource professionals as well to get a sense of where things are uh, being looked for and not found. If, for example, an infestation of a certain species is found this year, and maybe there was absence information that was reported in the past several years, that might give, you know, the, or at least helped you to, you know, theorize that maybe that is a new population just based on the negative data that was entered previously. So there's a lot of uses for the absence information. And certainly for uh, this event, it's gonna be really valuable as well. So if you don't have a login account for IMAP Invasives already, uh, it's fairly easy to get one. All you have to do is go online to imapinvasives.org or paimapinvasives.org. And at the top of both of those web pages is a login button. And you can actually see it here in the background. This is the PA IMAP Invasives website. If you click on that login button, it will take you to a form that looks like this. And if you fill that out and submit it, uh, you will get an email shortly there afterwards from NatureServe, which NatureServe is the current developer of IMAP Invasives. And that email will ask you to confirm your account. So as long as you get that email, 
and confirm your account, you should be good to go. The other thing that you're gonna to need to do in order to participate in this event is to join um, the 2021 Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt Project in IMAP Invasives. Uh, so any data records that you're creating, whether it's presence or absence, you wanna make sure that it's tagged to this project. And in order to um, uh, sign up and be a member of this project, you're gonna log into IMAP Invasives and make sure that you do that in the online version. You can't um, uh, request to be part of the project in either of the apps that I just mentioned a little bit ago. So make sure you're logging into IMAP Invasives online and click on the main menu in the upper left corner, uh, which you can see in this image is right here. And then if you look in the drop down menu, you should see an option that says projects. If you click on that and then type in the name Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt 2021 in the search box, you should see that project name come up. And if you click on that and open it up so you can see the scavenger hunt profile page, which you can sort of see here in the background on this image, you should see a little um, uh, blue text area that says request to join project. So you'll click on that. That will submit your, uh, your request. I will get that request and I will um, uh, you know, go, go shoot through and make sure that that request gets accepted as soon as possible. And you will get an email letting you know that, that you're now part of the project when that um, goes through. So again, making sure that you're doing that step, that's really important. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, minimize my screen here and I'm gonna do a quick demo of how to use the IMAP Invasives mobile app. So in case some of you haven't used that before, um, I'm going to uh, uh, kind of demo that here tonight. And for those of you who have, this will just be a refresher for you. So just give me a moment here. I'm gonna pull it up on my screen and we'll go ahead and start doing our demo. Okay, whoops. Okay. All right, so I've already got IMAP Invasives, the mobile app downloaded onto my phone. You can get it either from uh, the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. So whether you have an Android or an iPhone, it shouldn't matter. When you open up the app on your phone, the first thing that you'll see are these kind of white cursive-like instructions. And it just gives you um, kind of a basic idea of you know, what, what the different tools are in the app. Um, and, and just kind of gives a very quick overview. If you tap on your screen, those instructions will go away and you can start using the app. The first thing you wanna do though, before you create any data is to set up your preferences. And the way you do that is if you click on that upper um, left corner menu and choose preferences, you wanna make sure that you take a few minutes and fill out this section first. So if you're new to the app, all of this information will be blank. Mine's already filled in because I've already, I already have it downloaded onto my phone. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your jurisdiction says Pennsylvania. The next thing you wanna do is make sure that you fill in your IMAP Invasives username and password. So the information that you use to set up your login account. So your username is gonna be your email address and whatever password that you chose when you were selecting and signing up for your account. The next thing you wanna do, and this is really important to so make sure that you do this, is tap this uh, button that says retrieve IMAP list. And prior to doing all this on your mobile app, what I'm, what I'm showing you here tonight, you wanna make sure that you have all of your information as far as your, or your affiliated organization, your projects that you're a part of, such as the scavenger hunt, um, all of that is already set up in your IMAP Invasives profile online because what this button just did is it's pulling that information from IMAP Invasives online into your mobile app. So they're not directly connected unless you manually do it. And this is how you do that. So it just pulled in the most updated track suit species list, as well as all the projects that I'm a part of and my affiliated organization. So once you do that, then you can keep going through and setting up um, your preferences here. The next thing is asking you how you want the species list to display when you're, when you're creating a data record. So right now I have it set to both scientific and common. You can choose to have just scientific names or you can choose just to have common names. 
I would recommend not just having common names and either having scientific or scientific and common. And the reason for that is a lot of times species will be known by various common names. Sometimes species can be known up to like five or 10 common, uh, common names. So you might know a species by a certain common name and we have it tracked under a different common name. So if you're looking for that name, you might not find it and get confused and think we're not tracking it. So it's easier and sometimes better if you um, have the scientific names show up as well. That way you can double check to know what species we have and which one you're thinking of. There's also the option to have a custom species list on here. And the purpose of that is, so right now in um, Pennsylvania IMAP, we have close to or slightly over 400 species of invasive plants, animals, and insects that we're tracking. And when you scroll through that list, as you can see here, it's pretty long. Uh, so it can take a while to go through. And when you're scrolling through this list, when you're creating a record, it sort of slows you down a little bit. So what you can do is you can check some of these boxes and you can see here, I've already got one checked um, for bamboo. You can go through and just check the species that you're only interested in looking for or only the ones that you're thinking of finding. So for the scavenger hunt, you can go through and make a custom list of just the 15 species on there and then say, okay, and save that. And then when I go in and create a test record, which I'll do here in a moment, you'll see then that the track species list is a lot smaller and a lot shorter because we've now set up that custom list. And you can have that as an option. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, but it is there if you, if you want to use that. Okay, keeping uh, uh, continuing down here. So there is the picture quality. I always have mine set at 50% and it seems to be fine. So I've never changed that. You also have the option to save photos that you take with your IMAP mobile app to save that to your, fo your, um, your phone or tablets uh, library. So if you wanna do that, just click that checkbox there. There's also the option on how you want your base map to view. So whether that's the satellite or aerial imagery. So basically you can see where a road is, you can see the greenery of a forest, you can see the blue of a water body uh, or a road, which is more of like a drawing kind of base map. So I usually have mine set to the satellite and aerial imagery, but that's just my preference. There's also information set up about how you want the zoom to work. Um, the measurement system, whether that's feet or um, uh, meters, metric. And then there's also your default project. So you can see I've already got my default project set to the scavenger hunt. And I have my organization filled in here. This is all going to help so that when I'm creating data records, some of this information will just auto populate so that I don't have to worry about filling it in myself. So then once you've made all the changes that you've made in here in your preferences, make sure that you hit that save button. Now you're ready to go in and actually create an option. That add observation button there at the very top. And you can take a photo using your camera, or if you've already taken a photo of that plant or, or insect, um, you know, like a few seconds ago and it's saved in your device's library, you can say select photo from library. So I'm just going to do that since I am going to select an image here that I've already got on my phone. Now, this much message that pops up here is reminding me that there was some uh, recent updates that was made to the IMAP Invasives mobile app where it's now able to determine the date and location of, um, of a species that you're reporting based on that information that gets saved to the photo when you take it. Um, so this particular image that I'm um, uh, putting on here, I got from the internet. So that's why it's not able to determine that information because I didn't take it myself but it is a little bit smarter now. So it has that capability, which is nice. So the next thing it's gonna ask you to do is to fill out the species that you found. So I'm just gonna, um, well, before I do that, before I select a species here, again, as you can see, this is really long. This is that 400 or so species that we currently track. If I check that custom list, like I told, talked about a little bit earlier, now my list is a lot shorter. And this is actually all the species that are on uh, the checklist right now. Um, so you can choose from any of these species. It's, it's now a lot easier to go through and select whatever you want to select. Um, so we'll just go ahead and choose one of these here. Uh, you have the option to say whether you detected it or not. So again, if you found it or, or you looked for it and you didn't find it, so detected or not detected. So we'll say detected here. 
The observation date will default to today's date. You can change that if you need to. If maybe you observed something yesterday, you can change that date to yesterday. And uh, with your GPS automatically turned on, it will generally know your location where you are and map that accordingly. If that location seems off, you can always uncheck that GPS box and you can move your map around as you need to to wherever the location is that you were that you made uh, your finding at. I do wanna mention that, um, you know, if you're looking at a plant, for example, and it's 20 feet away from you uh, and you're standing that far away, your app will mark that plant as being where you're standing, which is 20 feet away from the location. So you wanna make sure that when you're making an observation point that you are standing, or if you're in a boat and you're floating and looking at some aquatic vegetation, that you are as near to that plant or insect as you possibly can be because that's gonna ensure that you're mapping it as accurately as possible. And I mentioned that here because sometimes people will map things that I map and I realized that that's exactly what happened. They were standing far away and they just mapped it, um, you know, where they were standing rather than where the plant or insect actually was located. So just be mindful of that when you're creating your observation records. And then it also here, as you can see, is auto-populating my project and my organization information based on what I have set up in uh, my preferences. So I don't have to worry about filling that in. You can fill in the time that you searched the area. So we'll say that I searched for about 10 minutes. It also is gonna ask about the size of the area that contains that invasive. So you can choose from the different options that it provides there as, as far as what's most relevant to what you're noting out in the field and the distribution of that invasive species as well. So again, you know, just choosing the, the most appropriate option there. And then there's an option to put in any comments that you think would be relevant to your record. For me, I'm just gonna say this is a test record, so I make sure that I go in and delete this after I submit it uh, again, but just including anything else in here that you think would be helpful for someone else that might be looking at your record um, that would be helpful for them to, uh, to know. So my thing timed out here, so I just have to reset that. So just give me one moment here to do that. Okay, all right. So once you've filled in all that information, then you're gonna to wanna to hit that save button. And you'll notice then that you just created a record and it's now living on your mobile app. You can continue to go out and create more records, presence or absence, and you will see row after row after row of records that will start to build up in your mobile app. Um, so once you're ready, once you're done creating data and you're ready to upload it into IMAP and Basis, because right now this data that we just created is not in IMAP, we have to manually tell it to upload it. So when you're ready to do that, you can either just click that little checkbox right there next to your record, or if you have a lot of records, you can click the upper left corner menu and say select all, and it will check all the, the different boxes for you. I should also mention too, the little pencil that you see there above the checkbox, the little black pencil, that's your edit button. So if you need to go back in and change something about a record, that's how you would go ahead and do that. But once you're ready to upload everything if you and you've got everything checked, if you go to your menu and you say upload selected, and then you just say okay to that, you should notice after a moment or two that that record will um, disappear from your home screen. You should get a window that says, uh, uh, you know, the IMAP data upload was successful. Um, and that's it. The record is now gone from your mobile app. It's now in IMAP Invasives online. And that's what you need to do. So in case you would notice that you have records that remain on your um, uh, mobile app after you do that upload process, it probably means that you don't have the, you're not connected to the internet or you don't have a stable internet connection. So maybe try going somewhere else where you have a better internet connection and see if that upload process uh, will work for you then. Uh, generally, when people have issues with uploading, that's what's going on. Um, if you would encounter some other issue, you can always feel free to reach out to me and let me know if you have any trouble. But generally, just you know, going to another location or um, you know, somewhere where it has a better net, better internet connection will usually fix the, the trouble. Okay, so I'm gonna exit out of here and we will go back into the presentation. 
Okay, so that was all about the mobile app. I mentioned earlier, there's another app that you can use called Survey123. And uh, NatureServe uh, recently created a form that you can use to integrate into the Survey123 app that you can collect that data uh, specifically for IMAP Invasive. So it's got that data-centric IMAP Invasive fields in this form. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And so just like the uh, mobile app, Survey123, as long as you've got it downloaded onto your device, you can go out in the field, you can go wherever you feel like really, and you don't need an internet connection in order to use it. Um, so it's all you know, friendly as far as that is concerned. So again, this uh, app, just like the mobile app, is available for Android and iPhone devices. And there is a setup guide, and I'll click on that so you can just take a look at that. So there is a setup guide that will show you what you need to do in order to get those IMAP invasive data-centric fields incorporated into your Survey123 app. That is not, when you download the Survey123 app, it will not automatically come with that. You need to actually go in and add that manually yourself. So there is a link to that guide here in the story map that you'll be able to access uh, once the training is over this evening. There's also a, a webinar that I just did recently that provided information on how to use uh, both the mobile app and Survey123 in, in detail. So a little bit more detail that I'm able to talk about tonight, especially for the Survey123. So uh, if you have some extra time, I would encourage you to uh, watch this video. Again, here it's available in the story map and you can get a better feel for how to use some of these applications and if you prefer one over the other. Okay, so in addition to the apps, as I just talked about, you do also have the option of using the online database to record information. So this would be something that you probably would be finding stuff in the field, jot it down in a notebook and bring it back to you, um, with you to your home office where you have a desktop or a a laptop computer waiting that you can then incorporate your data that way. So there's two videos here in the story map. The first one uh, talks about how to incorporate a presence record or you know if you found something. So there's a video on how to do that. And then the second video here is how to record a not detected or an absence finding. So the process is pretty similar, just a few differences involved. Um, but again, the, the, both of these videos are really good at um, kind of showing you the, the steps and the process involved in creating that information. Okay, so that's all about data entry. Now I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, what happens once the survey um, or the, the um, scavenger hunt event is over. So as I mentioned, August is your window of time. So August one to August 31. Uh, once August is over and we're into September, you will have till the 15th of September to enter your presence and absence information into IMAP Invasives. Um, some of you may not need that extra time, but I like to give that extra time because sometimes people forget that they have data stored on their mobile app and they just haven't uploaded it yet into IMAP Invasives. So you have up until the middle of September to make sure that you have all of your data incorporated into IMAP Invasives. And again, make sure that you are tagging all of your data to that invasive species scavenger hunt 2021 project. That's really important because if your data isn't tagged to that project, I won't know that it's associated with this event and it essentially won't count. Uh, so make sure that you, you do have all of your data tagged to that project. So then after September 15th, uh, I will take all the data that everyone submits and compile that into just a really short, brief data analysis to kind of get a sense of where everyone conduct the, conducted their surveys, some of the species that were found, um, maybe some of the more notable findings that might come from this year's event. And then I will send that out to all of you who are um, uh, participants in this year's event. And that will probably be sometime this fall or winter once I have a chance to kind of compile all that information. Um, and then I can then send that out to all of you. Okay, now I mentioned prizes earlier. So now it's uh, that time of the night now that I finally get to talk about the fun part. So on September 30th, so at the end of September, um, I will be randomly selecting the winners of this year's scavenger hunt event. Again, that will be five individuals. So to qualify as a prize winner, you need to enter at least one presence or one absence record into IMAP Invasives 
for each of the 15 species on the checklist. And each of those data records has to be tagged to that invasive species scavenger hunt 2021 project. So for example, if you only enter 14 records, it doesn't count. You have to make sure that you enter 15. Uh, that's the rule in order to qualify as a prize winner. I will mention though, um, you don't need to record any presence information uh, in order to qualify as a prize winner. So, you know, maybe you're out searching and you just don't find anything. Um, that's fine, but at least you were out searching. So as long as there's 15 absence records in that case, you would still qualify in order to win. So the prize package for this year, uh, as you can see, there's some images here. Um, you'll be getting a camping hammock um, and that will be big enough to fit two people. You'll be getting a $15 moosejaw.com gift card, a stainless steel water bottle that has the IMAP Invasives website and a little wordle all about IMAP Invasives and invasive species on there. And then also a hard copy of a field guide, a field guide called Invasive Plants of Pittsburgh. And don't let the name of that field guide fool you. It's not, um, it's not only relevant to Western Pennsylvania and the Pittsburgh area, but it really talks about a lot of different species that are relevant and being found in various parts of Pennsylvania. So it just so happens that the entity that created this field guide is uh, based in the Pittsburgh region, the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. And so that was why they named it that way. But this field guide is certainly very useful to pretty much anyone across Pennsylvania, I would say. So that's the prize package for five lucky individuals. So good luck to each of you. And I think that concludes my training for tonight. Um, so we finished uh, a little early, I believe. Um, but uh, if anyone has any questions at this point in time, uh, Kirsten and I are happy to answer um, what you might be wondering about or if you have any comments or anything. So feel free to use that Q&A and uh, type in any questions that you have. And if there are not any questions, that's okay. That just means we can all kind of get on with, oh, looks like we have a few questions that are coming through. Um, so Barbara is asking, how do you record an absence of a species? Um, good question. So in the mobile app, uh, one of the, the two options are detected or not detected. So in the mobile app, you're going to um, say not detected. And in the IMAP Invasives online, uh, you will have the option to create also a not detected record as well. The, the videos that I mentioned um, a little bit earlier that you can check out when you have your um, some extra time, this video right here will talk about how to create a not detected record. So if you just watch that video, it will uh, provide more information. And then also this video describes how to use the, the two mobile applications, the IMAP Invasives mobile app and Survey123. And in there it also is talking about how to create the an absence record for a species. Okay, so John asked, you had commented on not looking for plants on private property. What if you have permission? So if you do have permission um, from an individual, I still would not recommend um, documenting any of these plants per se. Again, for the reason of we're not going to be managing someone's burning bush or butterfly bush that's found and, and planted specifically on their property on purpose. Uh, really the goal of IMAP is to use the distribution information that we're gathering to pass on to natural resource professionals so that they can go out and treat the species that we're finding. So they're not going to go out and treat someone's um, plant that they purposely you know, incorporated into their landscape. It's, it, I, would, I would actually probably use that example as a way to educate people on you know not planting invasive species on their property and incorporating native alternatives instead so maybe that's just an opportunity for a conversation with someone that you know uh, that maybe doesn't realize that these species are invasive and that there's better options to include other species instead so hopefully that answers that question uh, again it's fine to be looking for these insects because 
anywhere that these insects are being found, that's you know places where management could potentially occur. But the plants is just a little bit uh, trickier. So that's why I'm just saying not to survey the plants on private property. Okay. I, so I would add just a second, Amy. Sorry, go I, ahead, would, I would add, you know, not not every invasive species you find on private property was was planted there. Um, if if something has, has come in that was not wanted, but it's there. I mean, it's perfectly fine to make a record for it. Um, but we are specifically looking for, as Amy said, areas that that we might want to manage um, or, have, or, or tell someone to manage. Um, so yeah, so I would say if, that, wrong, just, yeah. if the landowner is interested in having management done on their, their property, whether that's them doing it or maybe consulting with someone else, then in that regard, I think it probably would be fine. Um, again, it just can get a little tricky because we want to make sure people are all on the same page of what are the goals of IMAP? Why are we documenting this information in the platform? It's for management purposes. So distribution is you know, certainly a key part, but ultimately we're, we're using that distribution information to inform better management efforts. Okay, and thanks for, thanks for that, Kirsten. Um, so Victoria asked, what type of picture should we use for not present species? Very good question. So I would say if you're not finding a particular species, just take a photo of the area where you're surveying so that we can just kind of get a sense of where you are. And, and photos are always fun to look at anyway. So I would say, you know, make sure you're including photos for all of your records, but just take a photo of, of where you're at. So maybe you're along a hiking trail, you can just take a photo of, of that area. Or if you're on a water body, you can take a photo of the water body. So yeah, so just take a photo of where you're at. Okay, so Ed was asking, how do I find what I added this year? Very good question. So in IMAP Invasives Online, there is, and actually maybe I can just go to it really quick rather than trying to explain it because I probably won't do a very good job of explaining it. So give me, whoops, give me a moment here and I will just kind of walk you through how to do that. Okay, so if I go to where it says filter records, you can then um, filter under your name. If you have a registered account in IMAP Invasives, you can filter under your name. So Ed, I'm going to pick on you because I know you have an account already. So I'm going to look under Ed Hockey. It looks like you have two things that are showing up. We'll have to make sure that we figure out why that ha what's happening. But Ed, once you, um, we, we choose your name, you can then actually just search under the project name. So that will further filter the information that you're um, uh, searching for. So just be the scavenger hunt information. I know we don't have anything in there just yet, but um, hold on one moment, let me. There we go. So if you would search under your name and scavenger hunt and say apply filter, Nothing's gonna come up for that right now because we haven't entered anything under that project. But if I just search under Ed and we apply that filter, and if I minimize that screen, and sorry, I have to move a few things around here. I've got some stuff on my screen that's blocking my view. So if we then just zoom in on the map, and I know Ed, you're from Southeastern Pennsylvania, so you've been very busy in Bucks County. So we can see that Ed has a bunch of information already here in the uh, Lake Nakamixon area and some other places. So that would be how you can look at the information that you've already submitted. Again, further filtering it once you've just submitted um, information for the scavenger hunt is how you'll be able to, uh, to see that. So yeah, that, that filter records tool um, provides a lot of different things and ways that you can filter for information. But as long as you have a registered account, your name should show up in that observer dropdown list. It's a good question. Okay, uh, Melanie asked, is there a list of the 15 plants that has detailed photos and tips for identifying the plants? And just to clarify, it's actually just 12 plants and three insects, so 15 species total. And yes, so once uh, this evening's training is over, I will be following up with all of you via email 
with uh, more information, but also a uh, spreadsheet. And that'll be coming in the form of an attachment to the email. And that spreadsheet has all sorts of really good online links and videos that has uh, really great photographs and other ways that you can learn to identify these species if you're not already familiar with that. I will likely be sending that out um, tomorrow morning since it's already the close of uh, the day here. Uh, so look for that email from me shortly uh, tomorrow morning and that should provide all the information that you need. If you do find that you need more information to better learn how to find these species and how to identify them, just reach out to me and I'll be happy to provide more information to you. Okay, and then Barbara asked another question. She said, do we use Western PA Conservancy as our organization? How about PA Master Naturalist? So yeah, great question. So the, the reason why my organization is showing up as Western Pennsylvania Conservancy is that's my affiliated organization. That's who I work for. Um, if you want to mark the agency that you work for or maybe you volunteer with, um, you can look up that name in our organization list in IMAP Invasives and actually can go over here and show you what I mean. So if you go to the menu and choose organizations, you can choose or you can search under organizations. So if we look under Master Naturalist, we can see that that is an organization that we do have. And you can click on that and you can request to become part of that organization if you are not already. If you have an organization that we do not currently list in IMAP Invasives, um, you can reach out to me and I will create that for you. And then you can have that show up in your account. Um, also, if you're not affiliated with any particular organization, what we actually recommend is we have um, a group called Pennsylvania Citizen Scientists, and that is sort of a catch-all for all of you who have an interest in searching for invasive species and just uh, kind of active in, in nature and the outdoors. So you can request to be part of the Pennsylvania Citizen Scientists organization if you're not affiliated with any other particular group. Really great questions, everybody. Does anyone else have any other questions at all? And I, I will mention um, before I forget, um, I uh, am happy to answer questions after this evening's training too, in case you wanna reach out to me. So I have my email address here on the screen. It's ajewitt at paconserve.org. So please feel free to email in case you are wondering about anything else and I will do my best to get back in touch with you as soon as I can. So we'll just give people a few more seconds here, see if any other questions come in. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, I will wrap things up and just say thank you to each of you for being on this evening's training and thanks for taking some time out of your evening to be here. Um, I know we're all very busy, especially in the summertime. So I do wanna say I appreciate your time and uh, wish you good luck in your surveying for the, the species on this year's scavenger hunt checklist. And uh, I'll be following up with all of you via email tomorrow morning and probably throughout the month of August. So look for some communication uh, from me that way. And so from Kirsten and I both, uh, we wish you good luck and. I'm sure we'll be uh, talking to you all very soon. So take care and have a good night.